thank you, Mallory, and thanks, everybody, for inviting me, and thank you to the Land Connection for having me be here today. Can people hear me in the back? Is this adjusted okay? It's good. Thank you. <clears throat> well, this is a tough time slot. When they ask you to do a keynote, you're never exactly sure what you're going to say and who's in the audience, and then you feed them a big lunch like that. And if, knowing that most of the people are farmers, and you come in when it's warm, you eat a big lunch, uh, I'll try to keep you awake. But if you fall asleep, I won't hold it against you. I try to think a lot about the title that I give a presentation because I think it's one of the most important uh, images that I'm going to put in my PowerPoint. Today I'm going to, I call my talk, The World is Changing, Meet the New Boss, an Organic Solution. I'm going to refer to this title a couple of times as we go through our conversation today, but before we meet the new boss, I want to talk a little bit about who the Rodale Institute is because many of you uh, may not have had the opportunity to come and visit us or even look us up online. I, I hope after today you'll change that. Uh, everybody comes to these meetings with a, with a goal in mind. Uh, my goal is, is a little bit different than yours, and my talk is a little different than the ones we heard this morning. Uh, those talks were a little more technical and a little more in the weeds. Uh, this is going to be a little bit higher level conversation that I'd like to start, and what I really want to do is inspire you to think about your farm a little bit differently after you leave today. The person on the left over there, the older gentleman, although they both, I guess, look about the same age, uh, the guy with the, the sport coat on, that's J.I. Rodale. He's the founder of the Rodale Institute. And the way he looks in that picture with a coat and tie, that's the way he farmed. He always wore a coat and tie when he was out in the field because he really wasn't a farmer. He owned a farm. But he was a uh, businessman, made uh, electrical switch gears. His company still exists today. It's called Lutron Electric. So if you've got dimmer switches or anything like that in your house or your business, that's uh, Lutron Electric. His daughter still owns that business, even though she's up in her 80s. I don't think she manages it on a day-to-day -day basis anymore, but that was his business. He was born into poverty in New York City, uh, a son of uh, immigrants, Jewish immigrants. And he was farmed out and worked for wealthy people. And he said, there's two things people do when they make a lot of money. First thing they do is they buy fancy artwork and they hang it on a wall. So he bought artwork. He's, he's got a couple of pieces that are in some local museums that he sponsored. And he said, the other thing they do is they buy a farm. So he bought a farm. He was looking at what was happening in Europe. Again, he was of Jewish descent. He's looking at what was happening in Europe leading up to World War II. This was 1938, 1939. And he said, part of the problem with Jewish people is they're not farmers. They're part of the fed society, which is OK if people choose to feed you. But we saw what happened when they chose not to feed them. And so he said, we need to learn how to farm, and I should have a farm. So he bought a farm. His goal was to move the, his family, his children, out to the farm for the summer, it was sort of like the original Green Acres. He was going to have uh, fresh air, countryside, healthy food. And then in the, in the winter, they'd go back to the city. But not knowing anything about agriculture, you know, he turns to the professionals. He said, how do I do this? And they started talking about high input agriculture. And he said, you know, the switches that I make are directly related to the quality of the ingredients I bring into my factory. I cannot bring junk into the factory and turn it into a high quality switch. So how do I bring poison onto my farm and turn it into healthy food? I don't understand that. So he started doing his own research. And He's the first person in America to put the word organic in front of agriculture. So everything that we're talking about today really stems from the work that G.I. Rodale did. Along came his son, Robert Rodale. And Robert, uh, G.I. Rodale passed away in 1971. Robert Rodale took over the company, uh, the organization. And he said, well, you know, while my father had a great idea and had a great story, he didn't have any science behind it. He said, if we want to really impact American agriculture and talk to American farmers, we've got to have science, just like any land-grant university would have. And so he created the Rodale Institute, where I work. He bought that farm. The institute was actually officially created in 1947, but we didn't really get into some really good scientific work until the early 1970s. But if we go back in history just a little bit further, say 400 years before the birth of Christ, we can see that this philosopher here, Zeophon, he said, to be a successful farmer, one must first know the nature of soil. So he's beginning to tell us it's all about the soil. Around the same time, Hippocrates, which we all know uh, in, in terms of his link to medicine, 
He wrote a list of 11 things that, that a physician should ask or know about their patients. And one of those 11 things was, he said, a physician should know something about the soil where the patient's food comes from. So he's beginning to make this link between healthy soil and healthy food. Well, in 1942, G.I. Rodale wrote some words on a blackboard. He said, healthy soil equals healthy food equals healthy people. What he was telling us as farmers is that our job is not to produce crops. It's really not even to manage the soil. It's to make people healthy. If we believe that's true, then how could we possibly ever farm conventionally? Let's say everybody knows what Roundup is. Let's talk about Roundup for a minute. If spraying Roundup made people healthy, then the more we'd spray it, the healthier we'd be. But that's clearly not the case. So why is that a practice that we would absorb into our agricultural portfolio when it doesn't meet our goal? The goal of agriculture is not to kill weeds. Oh, well, there's days on the farm when we think that's the, you know, the, the main objective. And certainly, we spend a lot of time working on that. But that's not the ultimate goal. That's just a daily objective that we have to do to get the crop to feed the people. But the goal is to make people healthy. And that's really what G.I. Rodale was talking about. And he was looking at some of these ancient philosophers and thinking about that. And he said, we can't make people healthy unless we have healthy soil. So it all comes down to this concept of making the soil healthy. Well, if we're interested in making the soil healthy, we're doing, as farmers, generally, globally, worldwide, we're doing a pretty poor job. You know, it wasn't until the last few years that we were even able to talk about soil health. For many, many decades, the only thing soil scientists would talk about was soil quality. We had a hard time getting soil scientists to shift from this conversation about soil quality to soil health. You can have poor quality soils that are very healthy. I can have a really uh, high quality wristwatch. I cannot have a healthy wristwatch. This is not a high quality wristwatch, by the way. But it can't be a healthy wristwatch, because it's inanimate. It's dead. It's not a living uh, organism. So once we put this word health in front of soil, we've already delineated it as being alive. Now, if it's alive, then we have to treat it differently. You know, we're, we're, according to the World Wildlife Fund, the planet as a whole has lost half of its soil in the last 150 years. Now, that doesn't bode too well if we want to stick around for another 150 years. You know, at that point, we will be out of soil. Not a good scenario. Although, if you listen to some people like, uh, I just heard that, or read a little article about Stephen Hawking. I don't know if you know who Stephen Hawking is. The theoretical physicist, he's, in a, he's a paraplegic in a wheelchair. You might have seen pictures of him. A very, very smart thinker. He was giving a lecture at, Har at Oxford University right before Christmas. And he said, look, it doesn't really matter what farmers do because we're pretty much done with this planet. We're lucky if we can live here for another 500 years. A 1,000 would be on the outside. May not even make it to 500 years. In which case, we have to find another planet to go to in order to use those resources, because we've already ruined this one too much. I hope he's wrong. I tend to think he's wrong. But he's a lot smarter than me, so maybe he's right. Either way, we have to change the way we think about the soil. And no matter where I go, I'm here in Illinois today, and if I talk to Illinois farmers across this state, they're all going to say, it's not me. You go to Iowa, everybody says, it's not me. Yet I can see the soil in the Gulf of Mexico after it rains. It's somebody. My guess, it's all of us. We all contribute to that problem. In fact, in 2008, and then again in 2011, Iowa lost over 20 tons of soil on over 2 million of their acres. 20 tons is a lot of soil. That's about a triaxle truck. So if I came to your front yard and took a triaxle truck load of soil out of your front yard every year, it wouldn't take very long before you'd meet me at the door with your weapon of choice to stop me, because we just can't do that. And yet we're doing that on large landscapes. The problem is so large, of course, that you can see it from outer space. That's a big problem. I don't know if people saw this movie. The uh, movie came out, I think, in 2015. At least that's when I saw it. And it's a story about this uh, guy sitting up there on that rock, this poor sot that was left behind on the planet Mars when the spaceship took off. They thought he was dead. He wasn't. 
They left, no way to turn that thing around. It's going back to Earth. He's sitting there trying to figure out how he's going to live. So he was supposed to be a botanist. So he goes into the uh, pantry and he's looking how much food he has, doing some simple math, figures out he's only going to live for whatever, three months, and he needs to live for four years or whatever it is. So he finds these potatoes. And these potatoes were supposed to be for his Thanksgiving dinner. And he says, well, you know what? I'm a botanist. If I create a greenhouse and plant the potatoes, I can survive. He was surviving because he had soil. He carted the soil from the Mars surface into this makeshift greenhouse, and he lived. Couldn't live without the soil. Either can we. Now, anybody that knows anything about potatoes would know that those potatoes would have been sprayed with a sprout inhibitor, and they never would have grown anyway, but it didn't make for a good movie. <laughs> the problem we have with our food system today is that it's a broken food system because it focuses predominantly on yields. We heard Gary say, I'll take a reduction in yield if I can improve the health of my soil. We should all feel like that. Now, we're suggesting through our research that we'd never have to, in terms of yield, uh, just like with Gary and weeds, we don't have to take a back seat to anybody in terms of yield. We can have high quality, uh, high yielding crops and improve the soil at the same time. When I started with the uh, Rodale Institute, I, I was hired by Robert Rodale. Uh, that was back in 1975. And he said, look, here's how it works. He said, you're the farm manager. Here's your budget. You have to make your budget. You don't make your budget, you get fired. Oh, and you also have to improve the health of the soil while you make your budget. If you just improve the health of the soil, don't make your budget, you get fired for that too. He said, you have to be able to do both. He was a very avid bike rider. Uh, he built a velodrome to help train the Olympic uh, bicycling team that we have. And he said, you know, when I ride my bicycle, the only thing that wears out is the bicycle. I actually get healthier. So if all of you, instead of sitting here listening to me, got up and ran around the building a few times, you would get healthier. You wouldn't wear out faster. Because you're based on biology. He said the soil is the same thing. If we exercise the soil, make it work, feed it right, rest it right, it will, it will produce as much, if not more, than conventional agriculture will. And it will improve its health while you do it. That's what this is all about. It's not about strictly short-term yields. And in fact, if you do look at some data, and I don't expect people to read all of this, uh, I hate slides with a lot of text, but what it basically says is that over the last 50 years, uh, they looked at data from 1950 to 1999. This work was done in 2005. Uh, what they said was our crops, our vegetable crops, are losing nutrition. Our grain crops are too, by the way. In fact, looking at just 20 years worth of that data, when you go into the detail, it really comes out that we're losing about three quarters of a percent of the vitamin and mineral content of our food every year. Those of you with kids or grandkids, think how much broccoli they're going to have to eat in 50 years just to stay alive. There's only so much broccoli anybody wants to eat, and I like broccoli. So we know we're depleting the soil's ability to put the vitamins and minerals that it needs into the crop and therefore into us. I've got a friend who uh, raises about 1,800 acres of corn and soybeans, and he has a little beef operation uh, because it was his father's beef operation, it was his grandfather's beef operation, and so he keeps it going. And I went over there one day because we didn't have any GMO crops in any of our research, and I said, I need some GMO crops. We were going to be doing a feeding study with the University of Wisconsin. And he said, what for? Well, I said, this feeding study to look at organic, compare organic and conventional, we need some GMO corn and soybeans. Oh, he said, I can save you all the time and trouble right now. I'll tell you that your corn's better than mine. Hmm. Why do you say that? He said, because my grandfather kept very meticulous records on his daily rate of gain on his beef, and I have to feed almost 20% more corn to get the same daily rate of gain that he got. So I'm assuming my corn's not as good. But he said, the fact of the matter is, I don't get rewarded for high quality corn. I get rewarded for as many tons of number two corn as I can possibly produce at the cheapest price I can do it. What kind of reward system is that? So tons and tons of crap, and then we expect to get paid for that. So we have to change that. We have to rethink what we're doing. This is Dr. Alex Liu from Harvard University. A few years ago, he did a quick and dirty study with uh, school children, I believe they were second graders, out of the Boston school system, and with permission of their parents, took some urine samples. 100% of the kids had pesticides residue in their urine. 
put him on an organic diet for 24 hours. He bought the food, worked with the parents. He said, that's about all you can control, second graders, is for about 24 hours. After that, they start eating everything in sight. At the end of 24 hours, 100% of them had no pesticides in their urine. So go back to eating what you were doing before. It was a 48-hour study. They went back to eating what they were doing. At the end of that next 24-hour period, 100% of them had pesticides in their urine. I would argue that 100% of you in this room, unless you eat nothing but organic food, have pesticides in your urine. Now, he said, I don't know. He's a medical doctor, but it was a 24-hour or 48-hour study. He said, I don't know what they're doing there, but I know they don't belong there. And I know they came from the food, because that's the only thing we changed in this little quick and dirty experiment. He got that experiment published. And what he's saying to us is, the way we treat the soil in Illinois impacts school children in Boston. It's a direct correlation. Are we seeing more autism in our society? Oh, yeah. More attention deficit disorder? Oh, yeah. More Alzheimer's in us older people? Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, we're also getting overweight. Just went online and pulled this study off. Uh, you guys in Illinois, uh, we're probably worse in Pennsylvania. I didn't take the liberty of looking that up. You can do that. Uh, but you guys have dropped to 18 out of 50 states. You're number 18 for adult obesity. Well, it's no wonder we're getting fat. Look how much broccoli we have to eat. <laughs> we got to keep eating more and more and more. Our bodies crave more to get to where we're going. So we're not making ourselves healthy. We can't make ourselves healthy when we continuously pour on pesticides onto a living system or salt-based fertilizer. You know, uh, when you go to uh, the, the uh, pesticide industry, they pride themselves on the fact that they've now exceeded 1.1 billion pounds of pesticides annually. You cannot dump a billion pounds of anything on the soil and not expect some negative responses. But yet, as a society, we go, oh yeah, it's not causing any harm. It all breaks down. It's all good. Don't worry about it. Just eat it. And then it shows up in the food. Again, I don't expect you to read this, but the fertilizer industry kind of does the same thing. They brag that they, uh, they put on uh, a little over 21 million tons of salt on that same living system. So we dump a billion pounds of pesticide and over 20 million tons of salt on the system and expect it to be healthy. Well, we have an alternative solution. It's called organic. Many of you are organic. And even if you are, again, to quote Gary back there, it doesn't mean you're good enough. You got to keep improving and got to change and think about the health of your soil, not simply how you're going to kill weeds with a cultivator or a flamer or whatever else you're doing. That's just one little step in a much more complex system of improving the health of your soil. It's all about using your resources differently. I happened to be in California one day, and I was driving down the road, took a picture of raisin grapes. And I stopped there because there was a sign on that green field that said organic raisin grapes. I saw the sign, slammed on the brakes, pulled over to the side of the road, took a picture. Turned 180 degrees and took another picture. Same day, same crop. They're both grown raisin grapes. Both have the same trellis system. Both have access to the same labor pool, can go to the same bank. Uh, they can do whatever, whatever they want, the same resources. But one of those farmers, or maybe the same farmer on two sides of the road, I don't know. But on one side of the road, they're doing it differently. Which side of the road do you want to live on? Pretty obvious. You're a bird, a butterfly, an earthworm, a soil microbe. Which side of the road are you going to live on? Then why are we doing the other side of the road and saying that that's what we have to do to make a living? Anybody know much about bananas? You ever get to see bananas grown in? Uh, this happens to be Costa Rica. Bananas are a strange crop. <clears throat> bananas are a uh, understory crop. Even though they're fairly tall, the jungle's much taller, and they like shade. They like to grow in the shade. That's naturally where you find them. But it's really hard to farm them in the shade, so what we do is we cut down the jungle, and we plant banana plantations. And they look like the, this over here. You can see from these leaves, it's really hard to spray bananas. Bananas are unusual. Because they're an understory crop and they like the shade, when you put them in the sun, they get a fungus. Just the opposite of what most plants do. Most plants get funguses when they're in a damp area. Bananas get a, a fungus when they're in the sunlight. So in order to kill that fungus, you have to spray it. That's what they say. We've got to spray it. 
Well, it's hard to spray that because the leaves are like giant umbrellas, so you fly over it with an airplane, you don't get any on the bananas, that doesn't work. So then you can see where this guy's standing here. Imagine him with a backpack sprayer on and a long wand trying to spray up underneath there. Well, it's just pouring down on you. You might as well like swim in it. So the, the applicators kind of don't like that, but you can imagine. So they came up with a really unique solution, and this is true, this is what happens, you can look it up online. Uh, scientists created these blue bags. Some of them are red, I don't know what the difference is, but the bag is made so it's pre-soaked in fungicides and pesticides. And then as soon as the bananas flower, they take the bag and they staple it around the bunch of bananas. So the bunch of bananas, which ends up being quite large, grows in that bag. So all your, all your bananas that you've been eating, I'm sure the ones they have here in the, in the restaurant, that's how they grew them, in a bag of pesticides. When you talk to the people who live there and ask them if they would, which I did, I said, do you eat these bananas? They all laugh. They go, only Americans and Europeans would eat these bananas. I go, why? Well, first they said they're not the right varieties. We have much better varieties. And then they said, the other thing is, they can't be good for you. We grow them in bags of pesticides. But you don't see that part. And the banana industry, uh, Chiquita or Dole, they don't exactly like put that on the box. You know, they're not showing you that. Not to mention, those of you who are environmentally conscious, when they go to harvest those bananas, time is money, the harvest crew reaches up, grabs that bag, rips it off, and then lets go of it. So the wall of the jungle that faces the plantation is blue or red. And every now and then they'll go out with guys with long poles and they'll try to strip some of that down and get rid of it, but it's just millions and millions of those bags everywhere. The easy solution is these are organic bananas. Plant them as an understory crop. And you don't have to do any of that. They just grow and you can harvest them. It's so much simpler. It does take more labor. It is a little harder because you got to walk around the jungle to do it. You don't have to just be in that plantation. So we're talking about using our resources differently. This is a picture of the farm, the Rodale Institute farm in 1970 when we purchased the farm. That was the picture that the real estate company used to put on their brochure to sell the farm. We bought it in 2000, you see that picture. What's it gonna look like in 2050? We had to produce a marketable crop off of every acre every year and make money on that farm while we transitioned it to a healthy farm. Our soil organic matter content, for example, when we bought the farm was right around 1.7. Now it averages probably around 5.7. And we did that while we produced crops. You can do that. On this same farm, we know that long before the, the Siegfried family bought this farm in 1719, they moved there in 1721. It's an old farm, been there a long time. I know that because I have a, a uh, sister-in-law that it's really into genealogy, and if you go back nine generations of my family, my grandmother was born on this farm. We were some of the early people they threw out of Europe uh, early on. We were religious fanatics, crazy. Crazy people, destined to be organic farmers. <clears throat> so what's the farm gonna look like in 2050? I don't know. But long before the Siegfrieds moved there, there were Native Americans living on that farm. And they used stone tools and fire to manage the landscape. Today, we use tractors, diesel fuel, and, and some steel that we pull through the field to, to grow crops. What are we gonna do in 10,000 more years? Because they were doing that eight to 10,000 years ago. We think in 8,000 years, if you don't believe Stephen Hawkins, we're going to still be here. We're going to need to eat, whoever we are. And we can't do it without the soil. We cannot do it without the soil. And if we don't take care of the soil, it's not going to be there. So we're talking about changing our system. Uh, we understand that chemistry and biotechnology are legitimate sciences, but so is biology. You can go to the university here in town, and you can take classes in biology, legitimate science. It is a very messy science. Chemistry, while I don't want to say it's easy, because it's not, anybody that took chemistry knows it's not an easy science, it is a very clean science. If I take two beakers and I mix them together here, I'm going to get a reaction. I get the same reaction today, tomorrow, here, Pennsylvania, Brazil, doesn't matter where you go, that's chemistry. It makes it really easy to transport that material and create a recipe and transport it around the world. Biology is a very messy science. Whatever worked today doesn't work tomorrow. What works on your farm doesn't work on your farm means we have to put a lot more intelligence behind what we're doing, a lot more thought, and that makes it challenging and difficult. I don't want to say this is easy. Nature Magazine is a very prestigious magazine, and back in uh, uh, 2012, they did an article that said, the headline read, 
Overall, organic yields are typically lower than conventional yields, but my wife was an English major in college, and she always says, anytime you see the word but, you can negate everything in front of it. So when I say, honey, I love you, but, you can forget the honey, I love you part. She goes, now what? You know, what's after the but is what counts. So if she's right, and she always is, I wouldn't tell her that, but she is. You read through the abstract of this article, and when you get down here, it says, but. So that means everything up here you can throw away, and you just read from here on, and what it says from there on is that under certain conditions, that is, with good management practices. Isn't that your job? To be a good manager? Who wants to be a bad manager? Show of hands. Why would we want to be a bad manager? Of course, we're trying to be good managers. With good management practices, organic systems can yield nearly that of conventional systems. And I would argue that if we actually put our heads together and work on it, you're going to see that we do a lot better. Because we know that in conventional agriculture, we're spending $11 billion a year on research. $11 billion, and the data shows that the yields are pretty much the same. They'd have been better off giving us $11 billion a year as farmers and just let us split it up. We'd all be happier. In, in organic, we spent $170 million a year. I see a difference. I assume you do, too. Think how much further along we'd be in the organic community if we'd switch those numbers around and put our money where we know our heart is. Now, the challenge, of course, is a lot of that money is private money. It's not public money. And it's money that's being spent to create products that they can come and sell to us as farmers. We've all had that experience where, farmer, where salesmen pull onto your farm. I had a salesman pull onto the farm one time with a brand new Mercedes. I told him to leave. He said, you don't know what I'm selling. I said, I don't care. It costs too much. <laughs> he said, no, you don't understand. This is my office. I said, your office is too nice. I can't afford your office move along. I don't know what he was selling. Could care less. Because I don't need it. So what that, that's what the article really should have said. It was with very little money being spent, our yields are almost the same. And in fact, there's other studies out there. This one by uh, Michigan, uh, Michigan State, I'm sorry, University of Michigan. Uh, University of Michigan, uh, this is not an agroecologist person, but it's a paleoecologist. And what she did was they did some mathematical computations looking at the world, not just Illinois, not just Michigan, and said, look, if we didn't change anything else, we just transitioned from conventional to organic, not spending any more money on research, not changing what we eat or how we produce it, could we feed the world? And the data says absolutely yes. Not only can we feed the world, the second model that they used said we can produce twice as many calories as the world currently needs. And that's not taking into consideration that 40% of the corn that we produce in this country goes to ethanol. That's a good use of resources so that people can run jet skis around the Chesapeake Bay or something, you know? Makes sense. And then we say we don't have enough land to, you know, you listen to the naysayers, they go, oh, well, we're going to have to cut down rainforests to farm more land to get the food. We never tried to produce food. You go to Japan, they farm the median strip between the highway, the four-lane highway. That's food production. We can produce food. That's not, never, been, never been the goal. I mean, there's, there's corn in this coat. There's soybean in all the ink that's printed on your pages on the table. We're not trying to produce food. Again, there's another system, another way to look at things. Organic is a $70 billion business globally. I saw earlier in one of the presentations, I think it was uh, Richard over here was talking about niche, farm niches. $70 billion is a damn big niche. I think there's money to be made there. And what's really interesting is it's growing. 250% since 2002. That is a growing industry. We all need to be, and it should be, part of that. So why do consumers buy organic food? Well, first of all, the number one driver is personal health. People believe what J.I. Rodale said, and that is that the way we treat the soil is the way we treat ourselves. You can only be healthy if you eat healthy food, and you can only have healthy food if you have healthy soil. And organic, while it's not the only way to do that, is a very positive tool to move us in that direction. And the data shows that as well. They're showing that organic food 
can be over 50% higher in vitamins and minerals and some of the micronutrients as well. So some really interesting data out there. There's some other things that are stopping farmers from transitioning to organic or making this progress. One of the barriers is, and this is from the USDA's uh, Nas National Agricultural Statistics Service, NAS, they're showing that we have six times as many farmers over 65 as we have under 35. Well, you know, that kind of makes sense. How can you, we, we, you know, particularly in a grain operation, uh, it's a very capital intensive system. How are you going to get, I can just picture, a 22-year-old gets out of college. On average, they say in this country, uh, the average graduate has somewhere between $20,000 and $25,000 in student loan debt. So you go to the bank, you got $25,000 in student let, don't let, loan debt, and you say to the bank, hey, I'd really like to get $3 million from you because I'd like to be a farmer. Yeah. I mean, you're smiling now. Imagine what you'd be doing when they come to see you. You know, it's just not going to happen. So how do we get young people into this business? And on a conventional farm, how do we get them into a business where they're going to follow somebody else's recipe, get on the subsidy train, get all the crop insurance? I mean, yeah, crop insurance is great. The only reason we can afford crop insurance is because it's subsidized by taxpayers. If a farmer, any one of you, had to pay the full price of crop insurance for your farm, you'd go out of business today. You'd never make it out of this room. You'd be, you, you couldn't do it. It's like my son wanted to buy a, a farm. Uh, we, we farm at home, and my son manages the farm. He's like, Dad, we should buy this farm. I said, you buy it. Well, he said, I need the bank, so I have to have a co-signer. I said, that's because you can't afford it. No, no, I can afford it. I go, no, you can't. That's why the bank wants me to do it. <laughs> and I don't want to do it. I said, why would we buy land at $15,000 an acre when you can rent it for 45 bucks? Now, that doesn't make sense in any business sense. So how are we going to get young people into agriculture when we have this big expense? and we have a system that really dumbs them down and they can't, their goal is no longer to be the best manager, just a mediocre manager. Hey, you can borrow all that money, you can be a mediocre person in your community. Uh, yeah, and we wonder why they're not flocking to us. In fact, again, USDA says that uh, right now we are opening up around 60,000 high-skilled agricultural jobs each and every year and we only have 35,000 applicants. Pretty good if you're graduating from an ag school, your chances of getting a job, if you graduate it, are pretty darn good. I don't know if you can make a living at that job, that I don't know, but we know that we need a lot more farmers and a lot more ag professionals. Where are they gonna come from? How are we gonna get them? The world is changing. Remember the title of my talk. The world is changing. Where do we fit as organic farmers into that change? Organic is? By its very definition, scale neutral. It doesn't matter where you fit in this scale. There's a place for you to farm. The world is changing. That's a modern tractor cab. Doesn't look like mine exactly, but we got computers in all our tractors, and you probably do too. It's a different world. This isn't 1970 anymore. Look how rapidly things are changing. In fact, I just read an article yesterday in, uh, in the airport. Elon Musk, people might know who he is. Uh, the Tesla car company. He wrote a paper that said, within 20 years, there will be two kinds of people in this country. There will be people who have computer chips embedded in their brain and are interfacing with the internet second by second, and there will be people who are not. The people who are not are obsolete and will not be, have a place in our society. 20 years, 20 years. They already have the technology, so you no longer need this box or this computer. As, once you have that chip in your brain, as long as you're within Wi-Fi distance, you can download the internet direct into your brain. That scares the hell out of me. So while I'm talking to you, you literally could be watching a movie of, you know, whatever you want to watch, <laughs> instead of listening to me. You can, you can literally download movies into your brain. It's kind of interesting because in the article, or it was maybe it was a different article I read, they were talking about that same technology so that blind people could actually see. They don't have eyes, they don't have an optic nerve, but they can see with the sensors in their brain that pick up the sight because you can convert this internet wave directly into pictures in your brain. Without that, you, you will be obsolete. Where are our children and grandchildren going to fit into this puzzle? I don't know, but the world is definitely changing. Right now, while we're sitting here, well, I don't know what time it is, so maybe they're not doing it. It might be dark over in Algeria. But I got a friend of mine that's building farms over there right now. They're trying to build organic farms. This particular farm, the first farm, is going to be conventional. 
They have free land, interest-free money, no taxes, and cash. I, I don't know how many of those uh, D10 caterpillars I see then, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's one over there, eight. They paid cash for those. They're going to a million acres at one point. Right now, each farm that they're building is around 40,000 acres. First one's going to have 20,000 dairy cows on it. It's huge agriculture out there. You know why I said they're doing it? Because people in Illinois don't transition to organic, and they will. And they're going to produce food. Because customers and consumers want it because your boss is changing. This was the old boss. That's not the boss anymore. Anybody that believes that needs a computer chip embedded in their brain because it's changing. This isn't the person you have to please anymore. This is your new boss. We just heard that the average age of the farmer in this country is over 65 year, or is over uh, 59 years old. And there's more of us over 60. If you take the median, there's a lot more over 65 than under 35. Yet, millennials are the boss. I know you can't read this, but there's a lot of mis misconceptions between what we, as ag professionals, and the boss think. We think they're all broke. There's actually 80 million of them, and they spend more now than baby boomers. In 2017, they will take the place of baby boomers as the largest section of the spending society. They're driving the food ship. They have a lot of different things that interest them, and it's not cheap food. It's a different world. How, much, how often can you relate to those millennials? We don't. We need to learn what the boss wants and then give it to the boss, or my friend in Algeria will. And so will people in Argentina, and Romania, and Turkey, and India, and China, and everybody else that will eventually eat our lunch, because they're paying attention to it. And it's not just me saying it. Successful Farming Magazine just wrote this article in, I don't see the date, but I think it was uh, sometime in 2016, July, I believe. It says that, Millennials are driving the new food ag economy, and they want different things. This just, uh, article just came out in January of 2017, and this young lady here, Eve, uh, Eve Paul, was giving a talk at a conference. Maybe some of you were at the conference. I was not. And she bounded on stage, and she says, I'm the new boss. Get in line. Get in shape. These were ag professionals that, are, again, are all in their 50s and 60s and don't understand. What does she say? Oh, those darn, those dang kids and their fancy food. Those dang kids and their fancy food are driving the economy. And we're stuck doing something different. Millennials place value on different things. Value is not what we used to think of value. Value isn't just price. We always thought we were getting a good value if it was the cheapest price. That's not what they think. They think about values, and they're concerned with whether those cattle were outside being grass-fed or whether they're in a barn. That's important to them. They think about how those bananas are being produced and the ecology of that. That's important to them. They think about the benefits. It's that the value is a relationship between benefits and price. Unfortunately, too many of us are stuck in this mode. Anybody know uh, how you trap a monkey? It's simple. You drill a small hole in a gourd, you put something shiny in there that they want, they can get their hand in, but as soon as they make a fist to grab it, they can't get it out. You can walk right up to the monkey and pick it up because the monkey won't let go of the shiny object. How many of us are stuck holding on to that shiny object of farming the way we always farmed and we won't let go, and we won't change, and we're going to be trapped. And you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, competition out in the marketplace for those millennial dollars. Of course, the USDA organic seal was one of the first on the market, and people respect it. How many of these seals look just like this? I was at a seminar where they said they did a complete study of this, and they found over 300 logos that looked just like the USDA seal. 
I like this one over here, 100% natural. You know what that means? That means nothing. But if you can get somebody to think that it's the same as this, bingo. So there's people competing for that marketplace. Millennials are busy people too. So while they may be thinking they're doing something right, they may not be. We need to educate people. Well, you cannot rest on our laurels. We have to work every day for the market that we're creating and that we created. Fair trade, really important to them. Rainforest Alliance certified, important to them. Non-GMO verified, we all know that one's in the news. I've got friends that say, oh, I don't buy organic anymore. I buy non-GMO verified. That's the best, right? I go, no. Well, I read about it in the news all the time. It's like people have short uh, attention spans. They're all busy. So we have a job to do. Uh, gluten-free. You know, they put gluten-free logos on things that never had gluten in it in the first place. <laughs> because, because it sells. Somebody gave me some gluten-free pretzels the other day at a, at a conference, and I ate them. I said, you know what's missing here? Gluten. These things taste terrible. Uh, but it's important to some people, and we have to understand that. For us in the organic community, it's all about community. It's all about working together, helping each other. Uh, we know that the farm family needs a lot of help and a lot of resources. We've got to include the banking industry in this. If we're going to get more farms to transition, how are we going to help them do that? How are we going to create access to the resources they need to protect their income? We know we need to bring in the scientists and the ag community, the research community, the university people. There's a place for everybody at this table. Farmers talk to other farmers. If you're an organic farmer with some standing in the community and you've been doing it a while, share that information with your neighbors. Don't keep it to yourself. It's a huge market. It's growing at... at Double-digit growth per year. You, I could sell, you could sell all the corn that the state of Illinois could produce if the whole state of Illinois was organic. Your competition isn't your neighbor anymore. Used to be. Used to be you just had to do better than your neighbor. And then your neighbor was Nebraska, so you had to do a little better than Nebraska or Iowa. Now it's Algeria. Who in this room thought that they'd be farming the desert of Algeria? Oh, free irrigation too, by the way. Put the pumps in, water's yours, take all you want. Who gets free irrigation in this country? How are you going to compete with them? Free land, no taxes, interest-free. They went to John Deere with a check for $40 million to buy their first load of equipment. You don't think they got free dinner? $40 million. And of course, the Algerians said the equipment has to come from the United States because if you know anything about history, they hate the French and the Germans so they won't buy from Europe. And John Deere was happy to sell it to them. There's plenty of room in the organic, whoops, in the organic system for whoop, ag consultants. But the ag consultants aren't just going to be looking at crops and saying, oh, what you need is more fertilizer, or hey, next year, double up on that spray program because you've got some escaped weeds. What they're going to say is, let's look at the soil and start thinking about soil health. So there's room for everybody at the table. There's room for equipment dealers. It's just that we're not going to be talking about uh, spray, uh, spray booms and spray cabs. We're going to be talking about roller crimpers and all kinds of new tools and new exciting cultivators. But there's room for everybody. Somehow we need to create a safety net for farmers as they transition to organic. We got the early adopters. They're in this room. They're in Pennsylvania at the Rodeo Institute. They're around. When I first started in organic, I came to organic from part of the ex-hippie back to the land movement. It's hard to believe I had long hair, but I did. We all change. <laughs> hey, worse things can fall off than your hair. <clears throat> so I got, into, I got into agriculture from a sort of a philosophical, it's true, philosophical perspective. And we learned early on that in order to stay in agriculture, we had to make some money. People now are coming from, an agri from a monetary perspective, a financial perspective, but people who get into this realize that you have to buy into the philosophy or you're not going to be able to stay. You know why? Because the new boss can see through that. The new boss is looking deep into what you're doing, how you're doing it. They want to see where that beef came from. They want to see pictures. on the, They have it on their cell phone. I want to see your farm on here. If I don't see your farm's name on the product or on here, I don't buy from you because I don't know what you're doing. And if I don't know what you're doing, the assumption is you're doing it wrong. What are you trying to hide? Why isn't your farm here? Why aren't your animals pictured here? 
they actually want to see the cattle, see the chickens. Uh, I was in uh, China last spring. A farmer there had, uh, uh, he had invested $68 million in his farming operation. All, everything's different in China, we can go into that. But the bottom line was the people who are his customers are in Shanghai. He had to build a hotel on his farm because all of his customers want to come to the farm and see what they're doing and they want to spend the weekend there because they want to see where their food's coming from. They want to see the crops, see the plants, talk to the farmers, make sure everybody's being treated right, because they're willing to pay for that at the other end when they buy their food. Now, I'm not suggesting every farm here build a hotel on your farm, but I am suggesting that with the use of cell phones and eventually maybe that chip in your brain, people are going to see what you're doing and want to see it, and they're going to pay for that, or they won't. So how do we create those safety nets? Well, there are some companies that are stepping up. General Mills just announced uh, recently that they're working with Organic Valley to increase organic crop production. Uh, General Mills is the largest purchaser of oats in the world. They work with grain millers to grow those oats. And what they told grain millers is, and I don't remember what year, but I think over the next uh, 10 years, they want all of their oats to be organic. Why is that? They said because we're not going to be able to sell they're, they're, these are smart people who are looking down the road and they're saying, we're not going to be able to sell Cheerios that don't have organic oats in them because the people who are buying them, those 18 to 35-year-old young people, are going to be having children of their own and they want organic oats. Now, if we agree as a, a company, is what General Mills told me, that, or, that organic is the best way to go, why would we sell second-rate product to customers? How do I get the marketing department to do that? The marketing department says, I can't do that. If organic oats is right for one thing, it's right for everybody, let's just grow organic oats. Because if we do it at the scale we're going to talking about doing it, hundreds of thousands of acres, we can do it as reasonable as anybody else. And we can do that. Kashi, the same thing. Kashi is creating uh, websites, uh, development tools for transitioning people to organic. Important, important for us to pay attention to that. Now, we have a, we, currently we have an administration, and I don't care which side of the fence you're on, uh, we have an administration who says, uh, climate change is not real, and we have to take it away from like the websites of EPA and all the government websites. So climate change doesn't exist. Yet, we see here that um, this is from a study done here in, uh, at the University of Illinois that says climate change will affect a farmer's bottom line. I'm going to show you some data in a little bit that says if we change the health of the soil, we can mitigate the impacts of climate change. Farmers are foolish if they don't pay attention to the handwriting on the wall. Whether you believe what the Trump administration says or not, I don't care. Look out the window. It's changing. Prairie Farmer said the same thing. Climate change, it's real, and it's here. And this was done by the Illinois State Water, uh, blah, 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 water Survey. It says, Illinois' temperatures have steadily risen since the 1890s. Whether you believe it's man-made, I don't care. Well, I don't care what you believe, it's happening. How are we, and it's impacting your farm. How are you going to make, change your farm to take care of that? Because at some point, those millennials that are watching everything that's going on are going to say, we're not going to subsidize crop insurance anymore. Why would I subsidize a bad plan? And when they say that, everybody's going to suffer, except those people who saw the handwriting on the wall and moved forward in a different direction. But of course, in order to do that, we need tools. We need some science. This is some work that we're doing at the Rodale Institute. It's our organic farming systems trial. And I won't go into great detail because we could spend hours just talking about that experiment because it's 36 years old. I don't care what university you uh, went to or is in your neighborhood, you go and ask them for some dollars to do a 36-year-long study, and they'll laugh at you, and rightly so. It's a challenge. But yet, biological systems need to be looked at over a long period of time. The average research scientist, uh, their project is two-year study. Three, if you're lucky, four is like really amazing. This is biology. Biology has a time frame all its own. If you put your children to bed at night, or your grandchildren, and you wake them up in the morning, that little scientist in you knows that they grew. But you can't see it. But if you put them to bed at night and you woke them up 36 years later, you'd be like, wow, you need a shave. You know, the thing, you really changed. You need to look at these things over a long period of time before you can see the impact of that change. You can't look at your child from zero to two and say, this is what they're going to be. It takes 
I was going to say 21 years, but maybe it takes 31 years, I don't know, uh, before you really can see how they're going to mature and change as a person. So we're doing these long-term trials. We started this trial in 1981. About 18 years later, the USDA looked at what we were doing and said, okay, whoa, whoa, time out, time out. Rodale found out, this is going to shock you, Rodale found out that organic systems are better for the soil health and they can match the yields of conventional. We have a problem with that. So they created their own long-term systems trial. You can go see it. It's at, you pay for it. It's at the Beltsville Research Station in Maryland. And what they found out was exactly the same thing, that when they managed their systems, in the, theirs is called the Farming Systems Project, FSP. Uh, so it's a little bit different, but you can look it up online. They're basically finding the same thing. The organic systems are more resilient, equally yielding, and improve the health of the soil while they're producing that crop. The University of Wisconsin created a project under, currently being run under, under Dr. Aaron Silva, same thing. Iowa State started one right after the USDA did theirs, run by Dr. Kathleen Dellett, same thing. UC Davis, California, same thing, found the same results. Here's an interesting picture. When you think about, remember that climate change, climate is changing. What do we pay uh, crop insurance, what do we pay out on? We pay out on drought, or flooding. Those are the two main things that we pay for. And the biggest one is drought. It did not rain, this is dry land farming, it did not rain more on that plot on the, uh, on the right. In fact, the corn on the right was planted two weeks earlier than the corn on the left, and when it first germinated and came up, the farm manager at the time said, boy, I wish the organic corn looked as good as the conventional corn. Three weeks later, he said, boy, I wish the conventional corn looked as good as the organic corn. They switched places. Again, it didn't rain more here. It's just that the soil changed its ability to interact with water. We did that with farm management. We can change the soil on our farms. You cannot change the quality of the soil. The quality of the soil is what you bought, what you inherited, what you stole. I don't know how you got it. It doesn't matter to me. That, you can't change that quality. But you can change the health. We had a group of farmers from Iowa out here at our farm one day, and they looked at our soil, and they said, Jeff, you keep talking about the soil. They said, the stuff that I'm looking at, we, we would call road fill. This is not soil. I said, well, it's what God left us and with what we farm, you know, and we do the best we can. They're very old soils. They're very porous soils. They don't hold water very well. Two hours into the conversation, same gentleman put up his hand. He said, you know, I, I was the person who... Uh, complained about the quality of your soil. He said, I should tell you, us farmers in Iowa should be damned ashamed of ourselves because we're not doing much better with the resources we have because the quality of our resource is much better. But your health of your resource is masking that, and we're not getting it. We're not getting that advantage. Because these, this, this road fill soil, last year in 2016, the organic no-till plots produced over 200 bushel per acre of corn in the organic system. The conventional system was at 98 bushels because of drought. So as a farmer, what I would have done, I would have gone and collected crop insurance. But in the organic system, I didn't have to. We made our money. Not to mention it was $10.50 corn versus hmm, $3.85 corn or whatever it was at the time. We can change the soil by the way we farm it. And everybody says, well, it's all about tillage. It's not. Tillage is a tool that can be mismanaged, I'll give you that. But we're building soil with a moldboard plow. We build soil with pigs, we build soil with cattle, we build soil with grazing. You can destroy soil with cattle, you can destroy it with pigs, and you can destroy it with a plow. It's just a tool. I can build a house with a hammer or I can knock it down with a hammer, it just depends how I swing it. It's the same tool. What's different is the management. It's you, it's everybody in this room, how you're using those tools, those resources that you have at your disposal. So part of my goal with my talk here today is to inspire you to go home, look at your farm, look at the resources you have and say, is this the very best I can do with the resources I have? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But you need to look at that and say, you know, I could do better. I have these resources, I could manage them better. So by changing the way we manage the soil, this is Dr. Ray Weil from the University of Maryland holding these two clumps of soil taken 10 feet apart from each other in the same field. We started with this and went to this. Iowa started with this and went to that. And it's a continuum, so it still keeps going down or still keeps getting better. There's no lid on this. We can make our soil better and better and better and better as we use it. Look what happens when you take those two clumps of soil and put them in water.
I don't care if you don't do any tillage at all, you cannot stop your soil from washing away if you killed it. You ruined the health of that soil. It cannot stay together. It cannot stay in place. And we saw those pictures of the Mississippi Delta uh, out there in the Gulf of Mexico and all that soil. You know, there are people who are trying to develop systems to suck that muck off the bottom of the, of the Gulf floor and mine it for phosphorus so they can put it back in Iowa and Illinois and then send it back down the river again. If you came up with that plan and said it was an organic plan, they'd say you were insane. But that's what we're doing because we're running out of mineable phosphorus. It cannot stay in place because we've killed the, the soil's ability to do that. I'm going to jump along here because I'm taking more time than I, than I wanted to. Our, our conventional and organic plots in comparison, we're using a lot less energy to produce that same yield. So we get equal yields and it takes, if you look at the no-till, organic no-till versus a conventional with chisel plowing, we're using almost a third of the amount of energy. We can cut our energy use by 45% and still produce the same yield of crop. Now anybody who thinks energy is gonna remain inexpensive forever uh, is not thinking clearly either. And we make more money while we're doing it. I mean, everybody says, well, farming's a business. Well, if it's a business, why on earth would you sell conventional corn at pick any price? I don't follow conventional corn prices. I don't know. Do you know what it's at? Four or something, maybe? How much? 340 something, three and a half. And organic said, I got a friend in, in Argentina. They farm a large farm, 34,000 acres. Fernando Rivera, wonderful family. He was up, a, uh, well, I was down there one day and he said to me, because we know each other fairly well, he said, Jeff, I have to ask you, he said, are farmers in Pennsylvania stupid? We don't think we're stupid. I said, why do you ask? He said, well, here's how it works in Argentina. He said, I grow my crop, I put it on a truck, and I send it to the port at Buenos Aires, and I put it on a ship. Now, because our government is corrupt, he said, I have no subsidies to do that. Uh, don't I, he can't get government-supported crop insurance. He said, I just have to do it. I put it on a truck, take it to the port, put it on a ship, and now because our country's corrupt, I have to pay an export tariff because they know it's organic. It's a bribe. He pays the tariff. The ship leaves. It comes to Baltimore, Maryland. He said, I take it off the ship, and I put it on a truck, and I drive it into Pennsylvania, and I'm making money. You guys literally farm in the shadow of the building I deliver it to, and you're too stupid to do it. You'd rather take $3.40 a bushel. Opie dopey doo. And we say we're businessmen. How can that be? I know you quote, I think Richard quoted some uh, statistics on imports of uh, corn. And it's, it's really challenging to nail that down. Uh, when I was with the, uh, with the USDA Trade Commission a couple of months ago, they don't, they don't track organic corn separately. The only way we can tell is by looking at the uh, certification st uh, certificates that individual certifiers have and, and feeders. So we have a ballpark of what it is, but we don't really track it because we have what's called the harmonized uh, codes, harmonized import codes. Everything comes in as number two corn. They don't really know how to keep it separate. Uh, we're in the process right now of petitioning them through Congress to separate out. We picked on corn as one in particular. All you have to do is be able to demonstrate that you have over a million dollars worth of business, which we can do, and then Congress will order a, uh, a survey and they'll do all this, you know, it's bureaucracy and it goes around, and then they'll be able to document and tell us how much corn is actually coming into this country, but I think we'd all be amazed and surprised at how much is coming in. And it's coming from Turkey and Romania and Argentina and India. And there are, pardon me? I trust them all. You trust them all. <laughs> Good for you, Brian. <laughs> He's a very trusting soul. We do have a USDA who is in, supposed to inspect and certify all those farms if they come into our country. But how can Turkey raise their certificated, certificated land? Cert certified. That too, the certified land, 400% in one year. It makes it hard to trust and believe. And most of the purchasers in this country would much rather buy grain from Illinois than they would from India. They'd much rather buy it. Uh, I know Michael Berger. He's the owner of Elevation Burger, the largest uh, uh, purchaser of organic beef in the world. He said, I would love to be able to say in my restaurant, all the beef comes from the United States. But it doesn't because it can't because I can't get the corn to feed it here. Why not? We got all this corn that, that's not cash flowing. 
The bank just said it's not cash flowing. We know that. Why, why are we, aren't we changing that? Uh, some other interesting information. Again, a little bit, a little bit dated, but in 2009, um, New York Times reported on this article from PepsiCo, uh, who is the owner of Tropicana Orange Juice. What Tropicana Orange Juice wanted to do was look at their carbon footprint. What does it take to put orange juice on breakfast tables across the country and around the world? And they were looking at saying, if you, read, if you go back and read the article, it says they were hoping that maybe they could change their distribution system, maybe they could tweak their packaging or their labeling. You know what they found out? They found out that over 30% of their carbon footprint was in nitrogen fertilizer that they used on the production of their orange trees. Anybody that paid attention in junior high chemistry knows that 78% of the air we breathe is nitrogen. Nitrogen is not a limiting resource on planet Earth. Where it is in the form it's in can be, can, cannot be conducive to crop growth. I understand that. But we have this crop called legumes. If we would just plant legumes underneath the orange trees, we wouldn't have to buy that fertilizer. We could cut their carbon footprint by 30% overnight by planting legumes. A biologically sound practice. Did they do that? I don't think so. The bottom line is, if you look at this data over 36 years, well, this is actually only 30 years worth of data, what we see is that our yields are comparable to conventional. In fact, if you look at that green bar, it's slightly higher than the blue bar, but we don't like to brag. So we say the yields are the same. The profits were uh, almost triple. We used less energy to do it, and we emitted less greenhouse gas in the same process. No matter which measuring stick we use, because we're not just looking at short-term yield, there's so many more important things to look at. And we improve the health of the soil. You saw that while we're doing it. Now we're taking this experiment and we're uh, moving it up to the next level. This is going to be a vegetable experiment. I know this is a grain uh, talk. But what we want to do is we want to start looking at the impacts of what we do on the soil to what, how that impacts human health. So we're working right now with Hershey, Hershey Medical Center. Uh, division of Penn State University and some other folks to try to look at uh, some of the components that are in these crops. Like, for example, early uh, data indicates that crops grown organically have more of some amino acid. And I don't ask me how to say it because the word's about this long, but basically it helps our body prevent cancer. It's not in the conventional food. It's in the same soil, but it, the crop doesn't take it up. It's a whole different, because it needs that, that uh, microbiology in the soil to energize it and get it into the plant. If that connection's broken, it, doesn't, it could be there. You could have tons of it there, and it won't get into the crop. So we're looking at that. That's just one component. But again, trying to make that next leap, because what happened in the beginning when we started our farming systems trial, uh, everybody said, well, you can't grow crops organically at any kind of scale. It's great for gardeners, but you're never going to do it on a farm. So then we did it on a farm scale, and they said, okay, well, you can do it on a farm scale, but it really doesn't change the soil. So then we did a soils experiment for the next uh, 20 years, and then they went, okay, well, you can do it, and it does change the soil, but there's no impact on human health. Okay, we'll do that part two. Uh, we'll make that link. Uh, so we're, we're busy doing that. The other area of focus that we're working on quite a bit is integrated crop livestock systems. We've got researchers that are working on trying to improve this system and we're saying we shouldn't have this system in the first place. Uh, what do you do with all that manure? I was at a farm in New Mexico. Um, the guy said, I have a, it, was, it was a large grain operation. And he said, well, we have this little, we were talking about manure. He said, we have a little uh, feedlot over here. He said, we have manure from that. So we went to see it. It was 10,000 head, which you know, by our standards today is actually tiny. So we had 10,000 head feedlot. And I said, well, where does the manure go? He said, over there. I said, over where? He said, right there. I said, I don't see it. He's like, that isn't a mountain on the horizon. That's manure, 40 years worth of manure from 10,000 animals. They move it up with big you know, D10 caterpillars, and they put, it's huge. I'm like, oh. And it's, since it's so dry there, it just looks like the day they pushed it there. It's all there. So what are we doing? It, it doesn't belong there. We're taking all the grain out of the Illinois and sending it to the feedlot, but the manure doesn't come back. So it's a poor system. Why don't we get animals out on the landscape? So we've got a, a federal grant to look at that, working with Iowa State University and the University of Minnesota to look at uh, systems that would import animals back onto farms. Uh, you know what uh, USDA is doing with this system, of course, is uh, you give this project problem to engineers, and they say, well, what that needs is a roof. That needs a roof. Hey, we're all paying for those roofs. Everyone in this room that pays taxes is paying to put up roofs all across the country to cover those animals. 
You know what the next step is? They're going to put walls around that roof. And then those animals never see the light of day. And once that happens, then you can treat them any way you want, like we did with chickens and rabbits. But you know what millennials are saying? That's not what we want. We want grass-fed beef. We want our chickens to be outside. Chickens have to go outside. Poultry farmers go, oh, what do we do with that? Well, you cut a hole in the building and you let the chickens out. <laughs> not, all the lands, not all the livestock on our farms is above ground. Some of it's below ground. Some of it's small. We need to take care of that. Some of it's bees. We need to think about bees in our system. Uh, here's our hog operation, our, uh, a uh, pastured pork operation. We can do these things, using pigs to improve the soil by helping, having them manage the landscape. I'm talking about a different way of farming. Everybody said you can't do organic no-till. Yes, you can. We can do it. Dr. Gladys Zanotti uh, working with us on some organic no-till corn projects. Anybody remember that old uh, comedian that used to be on uh, in Nashville, Minnie Pearl? She always had a hat with a price tag on it. Gladys always leaves the price tag on her boots. <laughs> Maybe she wants to return them. I don't know. but. Uh, uh, if you can grow corn without cultivating, not to step on, on Gary's parade, uh, he likes to cultivate. Uh, I'm inherently lazy. I cultivate when I have to, but if I don't have to, that's, you know, if all I had to do, and that's all I did there, was plant that corn. I did nothing to it. That's organic corn. I did not cultivate it. I didn't do anything to it. I didn't fertilize it. The hairy vetch nitrogen that was there is what, that's 150 bushel corn because my neighbor took it off with his combine and he was mad, that's why he told me. He said, oh, he's an organic farmer too, he said, I spread manure, I plowed it, I disked it, I packed it, I rotary hoed it twice, I cultivated it twice, I harvested it, and I got 140 bushel. You got 150 bushel and all you did was plant it and go home. It cannot get any easier than that. We need to work on those systems. Again, imagine if we took that $11 billion and worked on these systems instead of something else. Where would we be? We know we can do this. If it works on corn and it works on uh, soybeans and it works on small grains, it will work on vegetables. Uh, this was Kathleen Dellett from Iowa State, was on a sabbatical in Italy. She came around the corner and she sa saw this sitting there and she said, oh, where'd you get that idea? And she said, he said, oh, there's this guy, Jeff Moyer at Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania. And she goes, I know him. <laughs> we have to share that information with each other. It doesn't do you any good if you develop something or come up with an idea and don't share it with people. What's the point in that? Uh, we also do have a very uh, diverse, at the Institute, we have a very diverse uh, veteran training program. We have a lot of people that need to get into agriculture, and we have a, a highly skilled, highly trained, highly motivated workforce coming out of the military, and we're retraining them to be farmers. So we say, need a farmer, we literally can send in the Marines. Literally. Why not? Let's bring those people on board. We need them. One of the interesting things about farm statistics is that uh, if you look at organic agriculture, We've got more young people coming into organic, people who are coming into agriculture as young people want to farm organically, and more of those people are women. Cheers to all of you. Let's get more women into agriculture. Let's get more young people in. We need everybody, and there's room for everybody. We have a lot of outreach uh, activities and workshops and field days. Uh, I challenge all of you to look at our website, find a day that suits you, a time to come and visit us. I know Brian came to visit us. I hope it was worth your drive. Uh, we, I challenge all of you to come out and visit us. We're always there. Even if I'm not there, there's no gates, no fences, no chain link, anything. You're welcome anytime, all the time, to come and see us. Together, farmers and consumers, we can change the system. We can change the world. Consumers is a big part of it. We cannot let them behind. We must bring them with us. Uh, we just started in September of 2016. We started an organic farmers association at Rodale. You know, up until September of 2016, we had a nationally recognized organic trade association. We had a nationally recognized organic consumers association, but organic farmers have no voice in Washington, D.C. That's a crime. We fixed that. So there's an association. So look us up online. There's some cards in the back. Join up. Have your voice heard. If you don't have your voice heard, I can tell you for a fact other people are speaking for you. The consumers association said, oh, we speak for organic farmers. Did they ask you? Because they didn't ask me what to say. The Organic Coalition says, oh, well, we speak for organic farmers. Really? They didn't ask me, and they didn't ask you. The Farm Bill impacts you. All these policies impact you. If you don't have a voice, if you don't share information, we've got a farmer in Alabama. He said, I can look for 100 miles in every direction, and I can't find another organic farmer. 
but through the Organic Farmers Association, he met a guy in North Dakota, and he said, you wouldn't think we have anything in common. We have everything in common. It's important that we share that information across borders and across states. If something's happening in Maine, it impacts you in Illinois. And you should have a voice in what happens there and a call to action. So please, pay attention to that. Look us up online. Come and visit us. You've been very attentive. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I would like to open the floor to questions. Anyone with questions? Yeah, I, I apologize for taking a few extra minutes. Oh, no, you're great. It's great. Any questions? Uh, I am in Iowa now. I've spent time in Illinois, and I understand there's a difference between quality and health and how that reflects on yield uh, numbers. Seeing the yield results in Pennsylvania to an Iowa farmer might not have the same uh, convincing effect. Is there FST replications in the Midwest? Well, there's two that I'm aware of. The one is at the University of Wisconsin, uh, run by Dr. Erin Silva, and you can look her stuff up online. And the other one is the work that Kathleen, uh, Dr. Kathleen Dellett is doing. There's is the LTAR project in, uh, outside of Ames that, that, that she runs. So you can look at those projects. Uh, we agree. Uh, that what happens in Pennsylvania cannot necessarily uh, be uh, adopted directly into Illinois or Iowa or wherever you happen to be. Uh, that's why we're in the process of creating uh, some regional resource centers across the country. We don't have them funded yet, but we have a couple of great locations that we're working diligently on uh, to try to create mini Rodale Institutes out in the countryside to work with farmers, to work with uh, ag extension, to work with uh, land-grant universities to try and create some uh, fine-tuning of the systems that we're, we're developing uh, in that particular region. Uh, we know the basic principles are going to work. For example, organic no-till works because you're smothering annual weeds. I mean, people have been putting mulch on their garden for hundreds of years, maybe thousands, I don't know. So we know it works. But how do we make it work on a... We've had a lot of success this year. That's right. And we've had some failures. You know, there's been successes and failures, but uh, enough successes that we know it can work. But how do we fine tune it so it works all the time within that region? We know we need to do that, so we're working on that. You mentioned land grant universities. I mean, ISU is obviously one of the big ones in Iowa. I'm from Iowa. Um, are you having much luck working with large universities like that or universities with a lot of money behind them, so to speak? We're working with some small colleges and universities like Delaware Valley University, and we're working with North Carolina State University. We're working with Colorado State University and Iowa State University. We're also working with Goshen College. So small schools, large schools. A lot of times, um, some of the larger schools are more challenging to work with. But you know, I would say that there isn't a land grant in this country that doesn't have some organic work today. 20 years ago, they laughed at what we were doing. Today, you know, we just had a farm managers meeting Yesterday, there's a group called the Northeast Society of Agricultural Research Managers. I belong to that group since 1981. Uh, back then, everybody laughed. You know, it's like, yeah, let's get the organic guy on stage and throw stuff at him. Uh, now, every one of them is calling our farm manager and going, how do you do this? How do I cultivate? We've lost those skills. Those skills are gone. And it's, cultivation is, is almost half art and half science. It's, you, you know, if I'm a, I'm a woodworker, and I'm, I'm not a very good one. Uh, I have tools. That just makes me a guy with tools. That doesn't make me a woodworker. You know, if you look at a, a, a carpenter or a framer, uh, you know, a framer's going to come with a chop saw and a nail gun, and they can frame up a house in about, you know, three days. You go to a cabinet maker shop, they must have like a bazillion hammers, all these chisels, all these planes, multiple saws, all this stuff to make a cabinet. Well, organic farmers are more like a cabinet maker and not like a framer. It's a, it's, it's a difference. So you can't just be a person with tools. You've got to know how to use those tools. You know, a $200 cultivator. You might have a, a, you know, a $20,000 cultivator and it doesn't work as well. Maybe it's just you. <laughs> Not you in particular. All of you. <laughs> and I include myself in that too. Maybe it is you. I don't know. Uh, you know, we, we, we have to learn how to use these tools. There's a skill set. But isn't that the exciting part about farming? That we get to learn new skills. That we get young people involved in what we're doing to learn skills, to practice those skills, to be art, uh, artisans of our craft, to be proud of our work, uh, to be able to show that off, to put it on the internet. 
So those millennials want to buy your product because they're going to say, I want what Chris is producing. Look at what he's doing. Amazing work out there. I want to support that farm. That's what they're looking for. That's what they want. And we are foolish if we don't pay attention to that. Patrick, Cassie's got you. So when it comes to building soil, mm -hmm. did you see, have you seen that there's any top model when it comes to building soil for when using animals or <coughs> just the plant-based systems? Well, that's a, re the, that's a really hard question because there's a lot of top models out there. You know, we've mentioned Gabe Brown and some of the other uh, stars that are out there that people are, are looking at their farm and, and seeing some interesting things. There's also some work by really, you know, uh, obscure people like Ann and Eric Nordell in Pennsylvania. Penn State's been looking at their farm for years and can't figure out how they're so wonderful at what they're doing. It's, it's all about the skill of the craftsmen doing it. And they can't, Penn State says we can't replicate it. It's like, because that you can't, you're not doing what they're doing. It's not in your head, you know, you know, it's not in your hands. Uh, again, just because I have tools and a pile of lumber doesn't mean I can build anything more than a birdhouse. I, I try. Uh, so there's a lot of models. It depends on the crops. We have people building soil um, like the folks at uh, Uncle Matt's orange juice in orange groves in Florida using cover crops and a roller crimper in an orange grove. And they're building soil. Amazing work that they're doing. Um, and the orange grove right next to them doesn't. And they're not building soil. So there's, there's a lot of great examples out there. There's probably um, multiple examples in this room of people that we should all emulate pieces of or parts of. You know, Jack Ersman is doing great work out there for a long time on his farm. We, we just need to look around and find those people that are, are good at what they're doing. And then those people, whoever they are, uh, need to be willing to share that information. I mean, they should be up here talking to you because they're as good or better than I am. Come to Rodale and look at what we're doing. We think we're doing some fantastic work there. And our neighbors all look at it, and you know the initial reaction is, "Oh yeah, well they can do that, but I can't." And then one of their, you know, we have a Mennonite community there, and then one of our Mennonite neighbors transitioned to organic, and they go, "Oh, well maybe we can do that." Now we got farms changing all over the place. Every time there's a hub of activity, and that's why we're trying to create these regional resource centers. We've noticed when there's a hub of activity. Transition happens around it. There's a reason that Wisconsin, the little state of Wisconsin, is number four or five in the nation with whatever Richard's numbers were, 240,000 acres. Why do they have almost 10 times as much as Illinois? They're not 10 times bigger. They're not 10 times smarter. Organic Valley is there. There's a hub of activity and a way to make that happen. Uh, in Pen Pennsylvania, a small state, we're number three in the nation. It's because Rodale's there. So when we can create a hub of activity and share this information, it's like wildfire. It just grows, and everybody in this room will be somebody to emulate and a piece, has a piece of the puzzle. So there's no one person I say, oh, go see George and you know, bow at his feet. It's not like that. Every one of us has the potential to do these things because the soil has the potential to regenerate. Uh, we talk about organic at the Institute. We never talk about sustainability. We don't talk about sustainable. Sustainable has, is a word that has a lot of baggage, and it's a poor word. Somebody once said to me, uh, Greg Bowman, a uh, journalist from Ohio, said, if somebody asked you how your relationship was with your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend, and you said, oh, it's sustainable, <laughs> would, would people be happy or sad? They wouldn't be happy. Why do we want to sustain a bad system? What we're talking about is regeneration, regenerating the soil, regener regenerating, regenerating our human spirit, regenerating communities. Uh, we were talking earlier here at the table about communities that used to exist here in Illinois that are gone, gone. Farms got bigger. I was in the airport uh, not too long ago, and uh, I, I talked to this guy because he had really nice cowboy boots. He was from uh, South Dakota, and he was on his way to Washington, D.C. to try and get some uh, money to build a solar plant to, so that they could generate enough money to pay to keep their school. He said, my children already drive 70 miles one way to go to school because every small town in between has closed their school. And he said, I know when that school closes, that town will die too. And they told him, well, your children can get homeschooled via the internet. He said, I know, but then there's no community. They're not going to stay here. The minute they turn 18 and can leave, they're gone. And he said, I bought up the last three farms around me. He said, my farm's now 36,000 acres. I don't want to buy them, but what are you supposed to do? Just let them go? So he said, my farm's getting bigger. That I'd rather have four people farming than just me and have neighbors. So we can't let these communities die. We have to regenerate ourselves, regenerate the community, regenerate the soil. And if we do things right, 
we can do all that and still feed the world. We know we have to feed people, but we want to feed them healthy food to make people healthy, not sit here and have people with Alzheimer's and attention deficit disorder. That's not going to work with six people growing food. It doesn't work. All right, Rebecca has a question. Um, is there a way, is there an organization where you can tap into the veterans that, that want to get to the farm? And work, do farm, farm yeah, work? Yeah, come, come to our website. Uh, uh, you know, the person you want to talk to is uh, Lindsay. Uh, just email me. My card's back there. I'll put you in touch with Lindsay. They'll get people that, uh, that you can talk to. Okay, thank you. Glad, we'll be glad yes. to help out. That particular, well, we have two uh, veterans programs. The one is with Delaware Valley University. That's a certificate program <coughs> that qualifies for the GI Bill. And then the other is a smaller uh, program for people that don't want that classroom piece of the education, just the practicum. Mm, for someone who would like to transition from conventional to organic, what sort of the main points he has to focus on? on the row crop operation? Well, for people that want to transition in row crops from conventional to organic, what's the first step or the main point? The main point would be to create a plan. If you just wake up one day and decide, I was conventional corn last year, I'm going to be organic corn this year, you're, you're doomed. I mean, you really need a plan. You really need to think things through. You really need to start small. I tell people, always start with 10% of your farm the first year. Uh, you know, when I was in Argentina talking with uh, some guys down there about the roller crimper, I said, start with a small field. Uh, they gave me 400 acres. They go, this is small to us. Uh, it's like everything's rel you know, relative. But uh, start with, you know, if you're farming 400 acres, start with 40 acres. You're going to learn a lot that first year and then move on from there. Uh, it doesn't have to be 10% a year, but get your feet wet, learn new skills. Uh, you have to, there's a lot of learning that goes on, uh, and then also go to meetings like this and talk to people that have done it before you and, and learn from their mistakes and, and share the information. It's all about the community. Um, I think that's what I would say. Hi, um, I have a question. You are involved in the Soil Health Institute, is that right? I am. Do you feel like you're having, uh, you're, you're seeing among the other partners in that a, a more interest in organic and are they shifting? Or do you feel like you're still kind of over here uh, in a token role, or do you feel like you're having a lot of impact there? Okay, next question. <laughs> oh, that's a politically charged question. Uh, what happened was uh, the Noble Foundation and the Farm Foundation started a group called the Soil Renaissance Program. The Soil Renaissance Program was a much larger group of people. There's probably 80 of us at the first meeting. Uh, the, there were USDA people there, there were Monsanto people, there's people from all over the spectrum looking at this concept of regenerating soil health. Uh, it's winnowed itself down to a much smaller group, but we now have the Soil Health Institute, and I'm on the board of directors of that institute. Am I a token player there? I hope not, and I've tried very hard to make sure that our voice is heard. The challenge we have, uh, it's the challenge we always have in the organic industry, is that we have a group of people that continuously say, everything has to be based on science. This is science-based, show me the science. We only have $170 million to their $11 billion. And they're saying, mm, you don't have good science for that. No shit, we don't have the money. <laughs> so we're trying hard to get more money and to say, my point is to say, if we get to the point where we say, the biggest problem we have is pesticides, that's, that's impeding the, the health of our soils, are you willing to say we'll take pesticides out of the equation? And they're not there yet because they would go apoplectic. They would go, no, that's not real agriculture because they haven't figured out who the new boss is. But they will. And it's going to happen. It's, it's going to go the way you all are thinking in farming. It has to. Consumers are just too powerful. Their dollars are too mighty. And Monsanto can say whatever they want. And they will, and we understand that. And they're making money, and we understand that. And they're selling off all their chemical ag divisions to China Chem and other places. It's, no, it's like musical chairs. When the music stops, nobody wants to be without a seat. And that's what's going to happen. And they're, again, they're smart people. Those are not stupid people. So they're, they see the handwriting on the wall. They're going to make money while they can in the short term, but they're looking to get out of that game. Everybody's looking to get out of that game. And so, I mean, we're in the right place at the right time with the right message, doing really good work, as are all of you. And I think as long as we keep doing that, they can't ignore us. They're not going to be able to. 
In the short term, they can probably afford to ignore us because they have all the money. But we keep working on science. You know, Rodale Institute, our, our budget is four and a half million dollars. You go to the university and tell them, you know, four and a half million, I mean, they, they spend that much on toilet paper. It's true. And we're doing great things. You know, when I went to the Nobel Foundation, the great people, wonderful people, they have 139 PhD scientists. They have a billion dollar endowment. And I said, nobody, you haven't done anything. You do nothing. Rodeo Institute, three and a half, four million dollars. And we're changing, you know, I always say we're, we're pretty audacious. We got 36 people, we want to change the way food's produced in the world. And we're doing it. But we're doing it because of help like you and consumers. And, and you know, we can't be quiet about it. So we keep trying. And I don't think we're a token. I think they're serious about looking at the, the role that organic plays. Uh, a lot of organic farmers complain about the federal government, and they complain that we have the USDA in our, in our pockets. But the reality is if we hadn't petitioned as an industry uh, for those regulations, organic would not be where it is today. It's grown because we have USDA stature and standing. And the USDA has said repeatedly, we will never take on anything like this again. <laughs> we are not easy to manage. Yeah. Um, this is more of a thought uh, than a question. Um, we, we've talked a lot today about opportunities. We've talked a lot about transitioning to organic. We've talked about organic production. But one of the things that doesn't get mentioned a lot that I notice, and I end up mentoring uh, new organic farmers and working with them, and that is what it does to the human being. Uh, all of a sudden there's a new life and instead of talking about combinations of chemicals it's talking about new life in the soil and the health and and when they come to a meeting like this the networking is amazing and I think we need to recognize as much as anything how it changes the human being who's working with it. I think that's a powerful statement. Thank you. This farm family here, James Burkholder, wonderful family. He's got two more children since that picture was taken. What's that? He's, he's a busy boy. It's, it's what he says to me is it still gets cold at night. So he, I, don't, I don't think he'd mind me saying this. Uh, he's our neighbor at the Rodale Institute. Uh, he was farming. Uh, it's a 65 cow dairy. He owned 40 acres. Uh, he built a barn, put the cows in there. He rented that farm from his father-in-law. About two years later, I saw him putting up another barn. And I said, James, what are you doing? He said, putting up a barn. Yeah, I can see that. I said, but why? He goes, well, I'm going to double the size of my herd. I said, James, you can't produce all the feed now. You're buying in feed. Uh, what's going on? He goes, well, I can't make a living on 65 cows. I said, how many cows does it take? He said, I don't know, but I know it's not 65. And the bank will allow me to borrow money and build another barn, so that's what I'm going to do. I said, I got news for you. It's not 130 cows either. And 130 cows will just make you go bankrupt that much faster. He said, well, I've worked on this farm for five years, and I haven't made a penny. In fact, he said, the only reason I can live here is because my father-in-law supports me because I've never paid a month's rent in all the years I've lived here. Now, you see he's got children. He said. I haven't paid one nickel on this farm, and in theory, in 15 years, i got to buy another one for my son, because that's part of their culture. How do you think that makes me feel as a man? I said, well, I'm sure it doesn't make you feel good. He said, it doesn't. So when you've got a guy who's 33 years old that's talking about killing himself because he could figure out he'd be, it's the only way out, that's serious business. So we said, let's transition your farm to organic, and I said, we will guarantee your income. We'll put money aside. If you lose one penny, we'll make it up to you, because that's what family does. I said, we're going to get married. We're joined at the hip. We wanted to do, put uh, cows on pasture on our farm, and I didn't really want to milk cows, because I really don't like milking cows. We have dairy at home. I've never milked one cow. I pride myself on that. <laughs> if you talk to James today, he will say, transitioning to organic saved my life. It saved my family. We're now looking for ways to buy a farm for my son. He said he doesn't rent that farm anymore. He bought it from his father-in-law. The same 65 cows, just changing the way he used that resource. He said it regenerated my entire spirit and everything about me and my family. And my family is a success today because they transitioned to organic. It's a powerful, powerful statement. Although he came into my office uh, 
It was around this time last year, and he said, you know, he said, I'm a little pissed at you. Well, that's what families are like. I said, well, what did I do wrong now? He said, well, he said, Ida, that's his wife, he said, Ida came in my, came in the other day and said, you know, she said, we don't see the veterinarian anymore. And he said, I know, that's a good thing. She said, I know. She said, it's because we feed our cows 100% organic food. He said, yeah, that's great. She said, I know. But we don't feed our children 100% organic food. Don't we love them more than the cows? And he said, well, you have a point there. He said, start buying organic food. And she said, yeah, but have you priced organic fruit lately? And the kids love fruit. She said, so I want you to plant an orchard. So he said, now I got to plant an orchard because you transitioned me to organic. <laughs> So last spring, you know, and last summer, I, I stopped in one day and I said, yeah, I just, I, I can be a, a smart aleck, you know, and I said, James, I said, I don't see any fruit trees here. He said, no, and you should shut up about it, because if Ida mentions it again, I'm going to know where she got it. <laughs> but it does, it regenerates your spirit, and we see that over and over and over again where farm families say, I was looking for a way out, and now I'm looking for a way to get my children in. That's pretty cool stuff. Uh, we were wondering if uh, the Rodale Institute's coming out with any new research about uh, pesticide drift and GMO contamination. Not really. We, we've, we're, we started doing some work on uh, the uh, life cycle of GMO pollen in the soil, and we're doing some of that work, but we haven't really done much on, on drift, no. There's one question over here. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I think I'm next. Um, uh, that's why they don't let me be in charge of anything. I, um, you mentioned um, about your uh, colleague or friend uh, shipping all that corn from Argentina yeah. to the U.S., and I know that the imports on grain, organic grain, is, has gone up over the last few years a lot and also reduced prices for um, American farmers trying to sell in the United States. Um, and uh, I know the millennial demand is, you talk about that as a great moving force. Um, what about the top down? What do you think from your position um, and the way you see the industry would be the you know, go-to policy changes or what does the advocacy group have as their priority list to help growers um, deal with this obstacle of trying to get their sales out? Well, in, 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 good question. In the short term, we're looking at some real simple policy things like the checkoff program. We're looking at policy decisions like uh, hydroponics, things that impact farmers. You know, there's a big push to have organic hydroponic, and there are some certified operations right now because in the absence of standards, uh, some certifiers are making up their own and certifying it. Uh, there's a big concern about that because, as I think it was Michelle Wanderer mentioned earlier today, when the standard first started, it was a soil-based standard. How can you take soil out of the organic equation and call it organic? That just is a mind blowing, but there are people who want to do that. So we're looking at some of those easy things. We also want to talk about uh, where organic agriculture falls within the farm bill. And what we want to do is, and we are through our Organic Farmers Association, we're going to be surveying our membership and surveying organic farmers to find out what's important for you to be in the farm bill. In the last farm bill, I went to the Organic Trade Association meeting following the, the farm bill announcement. And they got up on stage just like this, and the uh, executive director of the Organic Trade Association said, I can proudly announce that we got everything we asked for. You know what I said? I stood up and said, you didn't ask for enough. Nobody gets what they ask for unless you're being placated. You know, they go, oh, that's all they want? Give it to them. We didn't ask for enough. We have to start asking for a lot more. We have to shift that $11 billion in our direction, because that's the way we're heading. So we. But we have a powerful, you know, it's just Rodale saying it, it's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You get 16,000 organic farmers to say, wait a minute, that's not what we want, we want this. I guarantee you they're going to listen, because they're in every state of the nation. Every, every politician wants to talk about and to organic farmers. There's a powerful, powerful voice that everybody in this room has, and we're not using it, and we're not sharing it. So we're looking to you to help direct what that should be. What do the people in this farm want the new organic farm bill to have in it or not have in it? You know, last time they almost took out the, uh, the uh, cost of payment for the certification fees where you get the cost reimbursement. They almost took that out, but then the trade association stood up for us because we're too weak to stand up for ourselves. Well, we're not, but we haven't done that. Uh, we're saying now let's stand up for ourselves and tell people, tell politicians what it is we want in the farm bill. 
What is it we want in policy that's going to help us? How does it impact crop insurance? What do we want? In the, in the beginning, when we had crop insurance and, and organic was uh, allowed to have it, we had to pay a 5% premium. Why is that? I'm sorry, we paid a 15% premium. And if you use triple stack genes, you got a 5% discount. There was a 20% difference in what organic farmers paid and what conventional farmers paid. Now, we got rid of that, but not because Monsanto said, oh, gee, let's get rid of that. It's because you know, the, the other people spoke for us and got rid of that. Well, now it's time for us to speak for ourselves. But we have to figure out what we want and what, what we want as an industry. How do, we want, how do we want to create that safety net for farmers that want to transition? Yes, a lot of us did it on our own, and we just went out and did it. But to get more people into this flow, uh, people, you know, a lot of farmers are concerned about that and are wary. They're scared that the market isn't as deep as we say it is because we don't have all the good data. Um, how do we do that? How do we change bank, lo bank loaning so that we can, if you are organic, the bank will share in that risk with you? Banks don't like risk, right? It's by their nature. But how do we change that? How do we get some, some mechanism to underwrite that? There's a lot of money out there that likes what we're doing. Uh, we heard a little bit about Iroquois Farm earlier, where there's a lot of huge head fund managers out there that want to invest a ton of money. I mean, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars into the organic industry because they have the money and they want to invest in something that is good and clean. You know, uh, I think it was Harvard University uh, got caught a few years ago uh, by their alumni association investing in Peabody Coal Company. And suddenly some student figured out that the alumni association was paying for mountaintop mining. The alumni association blew a gasket and they pulled $4 billion out of the coal company in one day. I don't care how big your industry is, $4 billion coming out in one day stings just a little bit. Not to mention, $4 billion in cash I don't think would fit in this room. And what do you do with it? You've got to put it somewhere. And they want to put it somewhere. And what's more wholesome and clean than organic agriculture? So they want to come in, uh, but they don't know how to come in. How do we create mechanisms to build safety nets to get them in to help us to support what we're doing? Uh, there is, this is a big business, and again, if we don't, you can see those farms in, our, in Algeria are going to do it, because they've got support from the Algerian government. They go, there's the land, take it. You need water, punch wells, take all you want. Well, we don't want to pay taxes. Okay, tax-free for three years. Can you give us some money, interest-free? Yeah, we'll give you all the money, interest-free, that's the government, they just give it to them. I don't expect we're going to get that from our federal government, but there must be some things that we can get that would make our life and our transition, if we're, what we're doing is good for the environment, good for the community, good for people, then why shouldn't we get rewarded somehow for that when it's a totally different product? We've got to figure that out together, not Jeff or Rodale saying it. All of us have a voice in that. I just want to give you an attaboy on the, farm, the Organic Farmers Association because if we go back in history real quick, and it's not been that long ago, if we go back into World War II, who were the, some of the first people that got walked into the gas chambers? Does anybody know? Naturalists, what we call organic farmers. That was some of the group that was taken first because they opposed to some of the trends that corporate Germany wanted to impose on the public at the, that, that time. So I'm really excited to see this, this association being formed because we do have people that aren't for it because it opposes some of the things you just talked about. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, yeah, there, there are people, hard to imagine, people in this country that don't like you. And they don't like what you're doing. And they don't like all this whole meeting. And they think the whole thing should drop and blow away. They don't like those new millennials telling them how to farm. You know, I got a, uh, an email from the state of Illinois and the Illinois Farm Bureau after the uh, GMO labeling uh, law was just passed that said, thank God Illinois farmers can go back to what they're doing, producing what we want the way we want, and consumers can just take it. They're not going to take it. They're not going to take it. It's not going to be that way. Illinois Farm Bureau can think it's going to be that way. And I'm not a great uh, prognosticator, but I can tell you over time it is not going to go that way because millennials are changing that. Um, my kids are millennials. They don't think the way we thought. Uh, the way I thought growing up. It's a whole different value system. And it's not about the cheap, the, the most food. You know, they're not looking for the biggest bag of puffed rice they can possibly get at the cheapest price. That's not what they want. They want organic bananas. They don't want those plastic bags in the jungle in 
Costa Rica. I'm pretty sure my father, first of all, he probably didn't know where Costa Rica was, and he didn't care. They care. His, his grandchildren care. And, and, and my grandchildren will care even more. And I, think, and I think that's powerful, and that's as it should be. And so I applaud millennials for that, uh, even though I don't understand exactly where they're coming from, and we need to work on that. So another question. Yes, my question is, as an ag lender, one of my biggest challenges this year is for farmers to treat their operation like a business. Financial management skills are really lacking. What we see is a lot of decisions in agriculture are all based on production, not on financial management. Mm. And the fact that people are here and thinking on their own is a compliment to everybody in this room. But I want you to take it a step farther. Know your numbers. Do not use other people as a gauge for them to tell you what your results should be and what you should shoot for. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage people to collect their own data, know their numbers, and run their operation like a business. Thank you. Good point. I mean, every farmer should be doing a little bit of their own research. You certainly should be collecting your data and your numbers and understanding what's making money on your farm and what's not. You know, I, I got a, a friend, he's a conventional grain farmer, and he said, I only look at one number on the bottom of my sheet when my accountant gives it to me. He said, if it's black, I do it again. If it's red, I figure out what I should change. That's not a good way to manage a farm. You really should know what every part of your operation is doing, what's profitable, what's not. Where, where we can improve the system. Great, great point. It is a business and we need to, to sharpen our pencils and our, our skill set. Thank you. We've, you've talked, we've, all day we've been talking about the benefits of uh, organic agriculture for the environment as well as uh, health. Uh, I'm wondering if there's a strategy or strategies either underway or imagined to uh, address the problems with honeybees and pollinators and the relationship between the uh, organic agriculture and the value it would have in solving that kind of a problem. As I understand it, the question is about honeybees, pollinators, and some of the environmental pieces. Well, I was just wondering if there's a, if there's a strategy or strategies underway or imagined for either changing policies or doing research that would help address the problem with the demise of the pollinators? Well, there is a lot of research going on around the country looking at pollinators. Clearly, people understand the importance of pollinator in, pollinators in food production. Uh, I don't think there's a clear, simple answer yet, but people are working on it. Again, the problem is limited funding. You go to you know, the uh, federal government and say, hey, we want to get money to study bees, and they go, oh, well, that's cute, you know? Uh, it's, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. Uh, because then you've got part of the industry, the Monsantos of the world, and I don't want to just keep picking on them because they're just, you know, the tip of a big iceberg, that, that are saying, we've got nothing to do with that. It's not the chemicals. Can't say that. It's this disease or this mite or this thing or that thing. Uh, they're always trying to deflect the information away from what's really maybe the right. cause. My, are, are there perhaps uh, clusters of organic agriculture that are geographically large enough to be able to research the, you know, comparing the, the health of pollinators versus areas where the, the, that kind of agriculture is, isn't prevalent? Uh, probably not. What, what the USDA says under the uh, organic honey uh, standard is you have to be able to show that there are no pesticide applications of any type, residential or agronomic, within a seven mile radius of your beehive. They said there's a few places maybe in the upper peninsula of Michigan and a few spots in Maine that might qualify. But for the most part, there's no place in this country where you can do that. Uh, there is some work being done in uh, New Zealand looking at that where they do have, uh, where their organic honey, most of our organic honey comes from uh, because they've got bigger areas where they can uh, guarantee under a certification standard that there is no uh, pesticides applications made because bees forage so far and so wide it is a challenge. We're doing some work at uh, Rodale Institute looking at some breeding work with uh, native bees. We noticed that the native bees are much less susceptible to most of the diseases and pressures from uh, the environment on them uh, because we bred domestic bees. You know the Russian bees uh, is what we're mostly using. The other thing that uh, bee uh, apiists have done is they've changed the cell size of the 
comb that the honeybees build on. And most, most beekeepers use a foundation with a predetermined size for the, uh, the, the, uh, the cell. And as a beekeeper, it, it's important for you to make that cell as big as possible because the bee's going to fill the cell with honey. So the bigger the cell, you know, the bigger the jar, the more honey they can put in it. But the problem is when a bee crawls into that cell to deposit the pollen and make the honey, uh, if they've got mites on them, the, the, the colony depends on that scraping action of the cell itself to scrape the mites off of the bee. So what we're doing is we're making our cell sizes, we're experimenting with making cell sizes much smaller, and we scrape all the mites off. So there's simple tools that we can put into practice that aren't all about short-term yield that can really change the way we manage bees uh, but people aren't, you know, everybody just wants to know, well, what can I spray or how can I get a GMO bee? You know, uh, and that's not the solution. Uh, putting a roof over the manure isn't the solution. You know, we're looking at the wrong places for solutions, and so there are small pockets of people uh, like ourselves, but others as well, that are trying to find different solutions, but it's challenging. Here? I wondered if the Rodale Institute was doing any research or following the agricultural hemp? Are we doing any work with agricultural hemp? Uh, we have staff members who are interested in doing that. Pennsylvania, uh, just in 2016, uh, passed a, 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 a bill that allows now for some research on hemp, and we may be looking at it. We will only be looking at hemp as a tool to improve soil health. So we'll be looking at, as a crop in a crop rotation, we won't be doing any hemp research, but we will be using hemp to look at soil health and the impacts on a rotation. We might be doing that if we get approved by the state. There's a, there's a uh, application process that you have to go through. In that case, please join me in thanking him for his expertise and time. Thank you.